Must be time. No. <laughs> okay, I have a few announcements, a few big announcements to make before we start. Uh, first of all, our, uh, we have a, a uh, traveling distinguished speaker coming next Thursday, same time, same room. Uh, he's going to talk about the Earthscope project. You probably can't read that. Um, basically, he's uh, using Earthscope data, which is uh, U.S. array seismic recording uh, data, to image the bottom of the lithosphere, and he's going to tell us what that means about the plate tectonic history of the western U.S. So plates crashing together, waves, and all kinds of stuff. So that'll be good. And also, he's going to be around on campus from... Wednesday afternoon until Friday noon. So if anybody would like me to arrange a meeting with him or would uh, like to spend some time, uh, that would be great, actually. Let me know. <laughs> In fact, yeah, okay. And the next and biggest news is the geologic roadmap of Montana is now available. <coughs> All hail the Susans. Yes. <laughs> Yay. Look at this. And Beautiful. Uh, it's now for sale in the in the publications office uh, for ten dollars. And it is and it is truly a thing of beauty. And it's a good size. It's on good paper. Um, so big. <laughs> All right, and now to today's speaker, Peggy Delaney. Uh, and she, uh, and <laughs> All right, so Peggy Delaney, she's originally from Butte, and uh, she has this long uh, list of different uh, careers that she's had. She started with um, uh, a ma well, a, a bachelor's degree and a master's in public administration from MSU. Um, and she used that in land use planning, health care planning, program development, clinic management, higher ed management, uh, and now she's at the Bureau since 2004 as a, an archivist, uh, archiving geologic data. And she will be a certified archivist come November. She also, little known facts, oh. uh, is a certified Brunswick bowling machine mechanic. Write <laughs> <laughs> like that down in case you need one. And an ex-mail carrier who has never uh, gone postal. postal. The day is not over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, take it away. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for taking time out of your day to come here. I'm going to talk today about archiving Montana's geologic and mining data. Um, and a lot of people don't know what archiving is. And is an archive a library? A lot of people don't know the difference between those two entities. They are closely related. Um, there's a lot of differences between them, though, and those are all the differences. For example, the nature of a library is a little bit different than that of an archive. Libraries contain published information, so you see published books that have title pages and publishers on the inside, and um, they're discrete items. There's one author or a series of journals. They're, they have independent significance. They, each document stands alone. A master's thesis stands by itself. It doesn't. Interrel it may relate indirectly to prior works upon which new information was built, but it's pretty much an independent entity. Mm -hmm. And the documents typically found in a library. Many of the documents are found in other libraries. You'll find the Journal of Economic Geology in many different libraries, for example. But an archive is a little bit different. Um, archives contain a lot of times information that's never been published. It's the working papers of a geologist. 
for example. That's what I work with a lot, or mining engineers. It's a group of related items. So there's maps, there's articles, there's um, drill hole logs, a lot of different items that are interrelated to a specific project that maybe somebody was working on. The, so they are related. There's um, significance um, in a relationship term, and they're unique. A lot of the information that's in my archive, you can't find anywhere else. We have copies of some things, but a lot of the information that we have, it's not available anywhere else. The creator. The creator is the author. Um, and you'll see the authors for journals. You'll see the authors for master's theses. Um, a lot of different organizations can have their information in libraries. What's unique about an archive, and there's archives for organizations. Let me backtrack a little, and then the kind of archives that I manage. For example, our federal government created the National Archives for its federal papers, and I'll talk about that in a little minute. So that's an archive. But the libraries, they contain information from different individuals or organizations. The method of receipt. Um, libraries receive books and their journal collections as individual items, and their decisions are revocable. Somebody can donate something to a library and then they can take it back. When they donate it to my archive, it's mine. <laughs> I keep it. And, and I get everything in aggregate. As you can attest to, if you w went down today and saw my office, I've just received a couple of collections, and you can't find my office anymore once again. Just about the time I get it cleaned up, we get another collection, which is great, except that my office looks terrible. The arrangement. Libraries arrange the, all their information, all their documents, according to a, a predetermined classification system. For us, we keep things together in aggregate. And when I first inherited the archives here, it's a little different because I inherited information that was put together by, by mining property file. Well, that's good and well, but now I'm starting to receive the, the collection of papers from different geologists that we're going to keep together. And we'll relate them electronically to different property files and mining claims and maps. But we're going to keep them as um, discrete collections of information. The level of description. Des the library items are described individually as a master's thesis. We describe ours as a collection of information, and I'll give an example of that later on. Um, the descriptive media, as I talked about a little bit before, in a journal or a publication or a book in a library, you have a title page when it was published, and that's all available to the librarian. Well, I have to create it for the archives. I have to describe it. I have to go through each document, determine to the best of my ability when it was created, what it was created for and try and come up with a description of it that succinctly tells what the, the document's about, the record is about. Um, access. Um, in a library, there's open stacks. There's card catalogs. You can go to a card catalog and then go to the open stack and pull it out and use it there or check it out. Archives, you're not supposed to have open access um, because things have, they grow legs and they walk away because we have very unique information and when we relocated from Main Hall to this building, I did a complete inventory, and we had to take things out of file cabinets and put it into our compact storage. And at that point, I determined that probably 5% of the, the information that we had cataloged electronically was not in our collection anymore. It went somewhere. So the, there's closed stacks, and we do not circulate the items. When people come to the archives for our information now, I let them sit if we can find a spot for them. And then I pull the information out. I'm there when they look at it. We make copies if we don't have electronic versions. And if we do have electronic versions, we copy that onto the appropriate media for them. So those are just some differences between those two entities. Libraries may contain some archival informa information. Our library has special collections. Archives may contain libraries. When I came to the Bureau, <coughs> there was a collection of USGS publications that we maintained here. 
mostly because we were in Main Hall when it was created, and it was quite a trek from Main Hall to the library. Here it's not so bad, but our researchers here, if they want information from USGS, we have uh, an index of all the USGS publications that we have available so they don't have to trek to the library, they can trek to us. This is probably the most famous of archives that we know about, and that's the National Archives. They had the honor of going there about a year ago, and their mission is to preserve the records of the United States government. But they only retain 3%. They have um, very, very strict protocol on, on identifying what to keep and how long to keep it for. And they're running out of room. This was the original building. Oops, pardon me. Oh, dear. There we go. That's the original building. That's the inside of the building. And it's, if you've never been there, it's worth the trip. It's absolutely astounding. I got to touch George Washington's personal papers. It was, for an archivist, that's a thrill. <laughs> well, they ran out of room and built this new building in College Park, which is humongous. It's, it goes on forever and ever, and they're out of room. So they are going to have another building constructed fairly soon. Yes. So anyway, um, so why does, why does the Bureau have an archive? Well, the mission of the Bureau the legislative mandate for the Bureau was to collect, maintain, and public information about these topics. And so collecting the information that we have at the archives is a way not only to build upon uh, new research, to make a foundation for new research, but it's um, information that people can come and access when they're doing their own research. Who uses the information? All these people use the information. We have students, we have government agencies, a lot of lawyers, engineers, um, the general public. People, I get a lot of telephone calls and a lot of people coming in with stock certificates and they say, I was going through my mother's things and I found 400 of these stock certificates and is it, am I going to be rich? And so then we go to the, um, the Montana State website <coughs> And we look in the business section of the Secretary of State's office and found out that the company went bankrupt in 1932. So, but, <laughs> but we do get an awful lot of people looking for information, old maps, um, any kind of history on properties. They're looking to purchase property. They want to know if there was mining on the property before. They're looking for geologic information. They want to know if there are a, a mine underneath my property. So we get a lot of people in. So what do we save? What kind of information do we save? Well, we save mining related information, geology. We've got all kinds of different physical specimens that the, that the Bureau has saved. Um, but we would like to save information records, which is not just a paper document, but a lot of other things. We want to save the ones that have enduring value. These are going to be useful and have value far into the future. They're going to be unique and have value versus permanent value. For example, I have a collection that takes up a whole wall of my compact storage and it's geophysical oil and gas logs that the Montana Board of Oil and Gas has and that they've made available on, as electronic versions on their website. But I inherited these and it's just so hard to let go of them, but I'm gonna let go of them because one, they aren't unique Two, we have good electronic representations of them. For me, they are not permanent. And so we reappraise our information. Um, and sometimes we keep it, and sometimes we don't. So what is a record? I said it's not necessarily just a document. These are some of the records that we keep. I don't keep water samples. So, <laughs> but I keep all this other kind of things. Um, and what is, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the archival process. There's basically three stages for the archival process. First, to identify, then preserve, and then make it available. I'm not going to read all of this. You can take a look at this. Identification, we locate the items. I get calls from people. My father just passed away. I went into his basement as much as I could. I found 300 boxes, and it's all maps and mining stuff. Do you want it? That's one way of identifying information and locating it. 
<coughs> but what I do is, um, in that case, I, I talk to the person a little bit and I find out, is it about Montana? Oh, there's Montana stuff in it. Would you be willing to send it to me? Oh, sure. And that happened on a collection that I got when I first, we were still over in Main Hall, and I got, I don't know, 50 or 60 boxes of stuff from a very prominent geologist who traveled the whole world and the United States. There were about five boxes that were Montana related, but I'm an archivist. I had all this great stuff, so I contacted the bureaus from all the other states. And I said, I've, all, I've got all this great stuff, do you want it? So I packaged it up and I sent it to California, New Mexico, Arizona, Pennsylvania, you name it. But I did not send stuff to Canada, I didn't send it to Africa. That stuff went away, unfortunately. So we determine the value, Is it, does it have enduring value? We get the items and a lot of different ways. And then we take a look at it again, what has enduring value, what does not have enduring value. Then we preserve it. We transfer the information to our facility if it's located elsewhere. We arrange it and describe it, stabilize it, safeguard it, and then we make it available to other people. We have an index now. We're developing a web page. We're conducting outreach and hopefully promoting it. Identification's tricky sometimes. Um, Kind of looks like my mom's basement when I first saw it, but um, it does get a little tricky. I mean, I have gone into places, and this, this is not too far from the truth. And so you just box things up very carefully, being aware of different things, that materials that might be around. You really have to be aware. So we've had respirators involved, gloves. We try and, and protect ourselves as best as we can. Preserving it, we accept it, transport it, and secure it um, by car. These, oops, gosh darn it. This is a uh, Butte Mine Corps. There was a lot they didn't tell me when I signed up with this outfit. I didn't, I didn't know I was going to be moving 500 trays of Mine Corps. We didn't really have, I couldn't store them in my office. It's not that big, so we were able to rent storage units. And so they're all in special racks on special wheels all dry, safe, and secure, and indexed in there. Um, this is the New World Collection, which is a collection that's been made available to us um, from the Forest Service. Um, this, is, uh, this is my office, and it looks better there than it does now, because we have another collection. And then this is Caitlin. She's doing restoration for us. So we do like to organize things stabilize it, and then restore it. So information is only useful if you can read it or you can see it, right? This is very typical of some of the information that we get. Pretty bad, but we have tools that help us. And so this is some of our restoration work. Phyllis Hargrave helped us with this, this particular map. Um, in identifying the colors on it and making sure that we had the right stopes, the right colors. So it takes a lot of people to make a map. This was one that was rolled up and so that we have that very evenly spaced mold residue on it. <coughs> and that's what we found underneath it. And so we're able to electronically restore all of these. It takes a lot of detail work. There are some things that maybe we shouldn't restore like this. That was kind of creepy. <laughs> my, I, people already know this, but I had a student working on this, came in, put the file on my desk, refused to work on it anymore. That creeped him out, so I said, okay. So we also want to describe it. That's part of making the collection available to the public. It's only available to the public if they know what we have. This is um, just an example of the description of one type of our archives. And that's our property files. In here it says what's in it and how they're arranged. They're arranged alphabetically by county by, and by property name within the county. Now a property can be a deposit, it can be a mine, which could be a group of claims or it could be an individual claim. And that's how we have that put together. We make them available, as I said, in person. People can come to the office and we try and help them. I get a lot of telephone calls, a lot of email requests. 
and soon we're going to be available on the internet. I keep saying that, but it's kind of tricky. This is our, the web page that we have, and I talked to our, the lady that does our web page, and I decided that was way too wordy, so I'm going to redo it a little bit. We are ready to populate our web page and have started populating it with maps. But populating it with the documents that are contained in the property files is a bit tricky. And the reason for that is when we get on the internet, when people get on the internet, we want them to be able to, to put in a latitude and a longitude or a township range and section. And anything we have for those coordinates will pop up in a list. So that's really tricky because you have to create a relationship between the latitude and longitude, the property, all the documents that are contained within that property, and any maps that it's related to. That gets a little tricky because a mining district can have four or 500 claims on it. And so you have to relate that particular document to each one of those claims and the maps that go with it. So for um, our SQL server manager, putting all that together has been a little tricky, but he's close. And so we're going to be getting that going pretty soon. We really want to make people aware of a couple of things that the information that they find in their basements that used to be their moms or dads, it, and if it's mining related, it has information. It could be worth a lot of, a lot of money went into creating that information and it could have a lot of enduring value in the future. We are very willing and capable of accepting and preserving this kind of data and restoring it. We have limitations on the physical restoration, not so much on the electronic restoration. And we, we keep the original scans as we get it. We keep the, a JPEG of the restored scans and then we publish it as PDFs. So if there's any question as to the reliability of the information that we've restored, they can always, people can go, always go in and look at the original scans and, and verify for themselves what's there or what's not there. We are keeping all of the hard copy right now. I'm quickly running out of room, but I'm sure that more room will be made available in the future. And our goal is to rescue, preserve, and make this available to people for future use. Why? The silver tsunami, have you all heard about that? The silver tsunami is the tide of us gray-haired people that are going to be retiring soon. Although, it's been my experience that geologists never really retire. They just leave their offices and they continue to go on and create more stuff. But, but as it happened, like when I moved to Butte, that's why I came back. My mom was getting older and she needed help downsizing. I went into her basement. It was, it was great because there was all kinds of great stuff down there. How many sons and grandsons and granddaughters and daughters call me and say, gosh, I'm at my dad's house and I have all this stuff. I don't know what to do with it. So they pitch it. If they don't know what it is, they throw it away. And it represents an enormous investment of time and energy and expertise that's lost forever. So we're trying to reach out to let people know we are willing and able to accept this kind of information and preserve it. There's a global competition for scarce resources and we want to have information available to build so that they can build upon what was done in the past in exploring for future development of resources using new technologies and methods. So that's kind of why we're doing this, in addition to our legislative mandate. So our priorities are right there. Agency collaboration is a big one. Records need to earn their keep. Those geophysical logs aren't earning their keep anymore. They're just taking up space and making me crazy. We did get some legislative funding. Senator King came through my office a few years ago <coughs> and started talking to one of my student workers. I had one student worker at that time and got very excited about what, what we were doing. So we did get some legislative funding. They asked us to try and um, get information about coal, oil, and gas. But a lot of it right now is proprietary and it's not available. We get some stuff, but we can't publish it. So I do have some of that information, but we cannot publish it. What I have done with the money that they've given me, it's kind of a four-pronged development. Infrastructure is one. 
We added um, 16 student employees, three support staff. I developed two offices for that, and they're in charge of scanning and cleaning up the things and making JPEGs and publishing. We do quality assurance. We got some dedicated archive servers because our images take up a boatload of server space and I was jamming up the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology server and so I got my own servers and we did get some server, extra servers so we have server redundancy so if one server goes down the other one kicks in and we're good to go. We got scanners. We got some new archives, very expensive archival restoration supplies. And we enhanced our computers. We needed better screens so that the restoration work could happen more consistently. Um, what we've done so far is we've scanned that many maps. We've cleaned up a boatload of them. We've scanned 1,500 property files. This, was, this information is about three months old, so it's, we've done more than that. The property files can have one page or they can have several thousand pages. So um, I should have put the page count because we do keep track of that, but it's probably, I don't know, 30 or 40,000. The New World Project, which is the one that I showed the slide of before, is one that we have to have completed by September because we got some funding from the USGS to, to rescue that information and to uh, preserve it. So, so far we've done about, we've scanned about 28,000 documents and all those maps. Um, when we first got this, it was way last fall, we got half of the collection. We just picked up the other half of the collection, which is not included in these totals. We packed, picked it up on St. Patrick's Day and I figured, you know, that's lucky, so <laughs> it was great. Uh, we did collaborate with the Forest Service and got the New World Collection. We got, um, a bunch of aerial photos that we have incorporated into our aerial photo collection in the basement of this building, which tops out at about 450,000 photos. Um, Montana Historical Society, through the efforts of one of the geologists that's a supporter and of our archives, his father um, donated all of his mining maps to the Historical Society and they became what we call dark matter. They recorded that they received them and put them in a corner and that was that. So the son, who's Ted Antonoli, worked a deal with the Historical Society. They brought them to us. We scanned them, restored them, made PDFs, put their credentials on it, and we're going to publish those. We gave the hard copies back to the Historical Society and gave them a digital copy. And they were just tickled because now there was an index. They have digital copies, and they're letting us make them available. So that was a really good collaboration project. Um, Senator Bradley Hamlet. Um, he came across these old plat maps and they were falling apart. So he gave them to us and we scanned them, we, we electronically restored them, bound them together, gave them the electronic copies. He was a happy camper. Buttes of a bow, um, they donated the mine core I talked about. This was stored in the basement of one of the buildings at the original mine site. Efforts to get this collection were thwarted by Mother Nature. The door was frozen shut. There was, this was last winter. There was a bunch of snow in front of the door. Um, a bunch of snow, and so we couldn't get in. It took a while. They thought everything out. They opened the door, and they put in new plumbing. Now, visualize this. You go in this door. You go downstairs. There's a little platform. You go down these rickety old wooden stairs, and there's all these mine cars and these big trays that you saw pictures of. We could not get the racks out because of the plumbing. So we had to disconnect the sewer line, turn all the plumbing off, disconnect the sewer line. We got pulleys, about 12 guys, pulled everything up using ramps and pulleys into trucks, used forklifts to get them over to uh, a football field, had to organize them, and core samples can't get wet. It was really cloudy out by the time we did this. So we were having to tarp everything at night to keep it dry finally got it all in there and then we had to put the sewer back. So <laughs> it was, that was fun. And then the BLM, um, they gave us a whole series of aerial photos. They loaned it to us. We scanned the aerial photos, indexed them, and they've been available to the geologists here who have been using them. We gave the originals back to them. We've also received from some private collections. Marion K. Jones was a man who was a, a consulting geologist in eastern Montana. And I met with his wife, um, 
last fall, and we just received that collection, and that's one of the reasons my office is such a mess. We've got boxes and boxes of maps and documents related to that collection. The Montana Ore Processing Company maps was contained in a book. It was a promotional book that Augustus Heinze used to try and secure funding for development of certain properties in Montana. And a geologist that graduated from high school with me came in and he said, I heard what you were doing. Why don't you scan these maps and preserve them? And can I have a digital copy? So we did that. And so we have these wonderful maps. And they're just great. And the different levels, were, I, I don't know if we're going to be able to do it. I think we can. But we're going to do a 3D representational model of the different levels because they lined up so, so well. And then Ted Atnoli also gave me some old mining maps of Flint Creek um, that are very old, very fragile. And so those are one map. I was so afraid because it's so fragile. We got it between two pieces of plastic, scanned it, and then I very carefully rolled it up. I thought for sure it was going to disintegrate. I had that happen one time before. I scanned the map, pulled that, peeled the plastic away, and it disintegrated. It was awful. We recently got about 40,000 uh, well information cards that we're scanning now. Um, and then we have two collections that are pending. People have told me that they want to donate those to us. Our challenges, as you can imagine, space is a big one. We, we're just filling up very quickly. Um, we're being very discriminating in terms of what we're keeping and what we're not going to keep. But we're still filling up. And I think our, our effort is to rescue information. And I don't want to turn anybody away because of lack of space. So we're, that's a challenge we're going to have to meet. Staffing. I use a lot of student workers. And, and I'm, I'm recruiting them from the Photoshop class here, so, which is great because they know Photoshop and they come with good ideas. But we're pretty advanced in what we're doing, and we're teaching them a lot as well. And then they, just when we get them going and they're rolling through, they graduate and they go, oh, I'm going to get a real job. And it's like, <laughs> really? So that's kind of tricky. Um, and then our levels are going to be dependent on continued legislative funding. So. My office might get really, really cramped because it'll just be me and a couple of people working on this. But we keep pursuing, we keep persevering because we have to preserve our past, our mining past, our geologic. Uh, there's so many people and so much money that's been invested into creating this information. We need to keep it. It's useful for today. It's useful for current projects. I have people come in and say, you know, asking me, what's below this property? We want to we want to relocate um, part of the highway you know, um, over in South Butte. Well, gosh, there's mine workings all the way under that. You probably don't want to put footings there. And it prepares us for tomorrow. Um, I'm hoping that the information that has been created in the past by the wonderful researchers that developed it can be put to practical use and save money for the companies that are trying to develop our research resources in the future and to do it in a way so that there's not as much disturbance of the land and reclamation that's already been done. So remember, archiving is important. <laughs> no, they, they were smart enough. They didn't put it in their file drawers. But I, my, my closing thought is this. Just let an archivist in your drawers. <laughs> we can help you. And for more information, please feel free to call me or email me, and let me help you preserve your collections. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, the Butte Public Archives scope of what they collect is a lot broader than what we do. They do have technical mining and geology related information there that they're very um, protective of. And so we don't have all the information. So we, do, we have a good relationship. I send people over there and I say, you know, you might check with the archives, with Butte Archives, and see if they have information there. But they have wonderful artifacts. I mean, they have. Well, you've seen their stuff. It's great over there. So we're very proud of that archives and 
do our best to promote it. Yes, ma'am. must have, uh, I mean, those moldy maps and stuff like that. What do you do to uh, decontaminate those or make it safe to? There, there, are, there are aerosol sprays that you can use on that. And so that pretty much does it. If they're really bad and they're very suspicious, we can send them off to, ha to, to companies that can decontaminate them. Haven't had anything like that. I have run into some really weird stuff, you know, animal droppings. Um, yeah, yeah. I haven't, that collection that I got over in Main Hall was full of very suspicious stuff. So that's when I was wearing a mask and gloves and it was just me back then. So that accounts for a lot of things. My husband can tell you that. Okay. <laughs> Yes, sir. Are there electronic um, accessible to the public indexes of what you have, or do you, if somebody in the public wants you know, thinks there might be something that you have that they'd be interested in, they would have to actually come and see you. They can call me. We can we can do a lot over the telephone. If I have something that's electronically available, I can send it to them via um, email. I'm talking about the actual item. Yeah, yeah, the indices are not available yet. Nope. Something you're working on? It's there, yeah. We've got it. It's there. But we, when we present the web page, it's going to be all presented with everything that we have publishable so far. So what's, I mean, if I was interested in a park or, you know, a mine or something, what's, what's the web page going to look like? I mean, do I type on the name um, or is it like I have to have a location? Nope, or? you don't. You can type in a keyword, part of a, part of a phrase. Um, a wild card phrase, for example, and it'll bring everything up. And then if you know the county, we'll get, we're going to have several options. You can have a name, a county. If you know the township range and section, you can put that in. But it's going to be a lot like GWIC, uh, if you're familiar with the Groundwater Information Center. So it'll be pretty flexible in, in accepting limited information to pull up a lot of our references. other states have? Do the neighboring states have anything like we have here? Arizona is doing a lot of work like that. Um, Minnes Minnesota, they approach things a little differently. It's kind of exciting what they did. All their geologists, the bureaus from Minnesota, they scanned all of their field notebooks and they were very proud of that. So um, I think indexing those other than by the creator, which would be the geologist, is going to be a little bit hard. I'm not sure what all is going to be contained within the field notebooks, but there's a, well, <clears throat> we've got funding from USGS. We've been getting funding from them for about seven years because data preservation of, of geologic and geophysical information has become a priority for the Department of Interior. And so we've been participating in a program with them for the last seven years or so to preserve and, and make electronic this kind of information. So a lot of states are participating in this. Arizona is one of the best ones. They've done a lot of work on this. So it's, it's becoming the norm and the expectation. I can, I can say that in Saskatchewan, all of the drill core produced in the province has to, it is archived in, in Regina. They have this giant building that's full of Every hole that's drilled, that's uh, cored, the core ends up after a certain period of time there, and, uh, and which is just amazing. I mean, that's that's terrific. Good foresight. Yeah. Because of the Butte core, a boatload of it was lost. I heard a lot of different stories that uh, some of the core was put into the Berkeley pit. Um, if you go up to Granite Mountain Memorial, you'll see some core. <laughs> you'll see some of the core there. Some of the core got taken as souvenirs. They, they just didn't perceive a value for it, and so it got lost. Um, lots of different examples. But the Bureau and the, the staff of the Bureau, way before me, had a lot of foresight. A lot was lost, but a lot was kept. Um, Lester Zion, his, his efforts in creating the Anaconda Collection and, and saving and indexing and preserving samples from the Anaconda, you know, that was, that's legendary. The mineral specimens that we have over in the museum, those are wonderful. We have 450 aerial photos. 
I'm not so sure that those are going to be of enduring value. Maybe, I know there's a lot of geologists that like to stereoscope those, but they are available online, most of them, all, most all of them, through uh, USGS. But we're keeping them right now. We have the available, availability to do it, so we're keeping them. Um, <coughs> our groundwater information is in all of the water well logs. We're keeping all of that. Um, so we have a lot of geologic maps that we're keeping, thanks to Susan Vuk <coughs> and Katie McDonald. Excuse me. So for the Bureau, we have individuals that made these efforts. And so now we have these collections. So, pardon me. <coughs> <coughs> Um, don't get a lot of international. We get a lot of private individuals that have purchased property. Oh, right. We get um, small mining companies that are looking to re-explore um, areas. Mm -hmm. We get consult a lot of geologic and engineering consultants. Lot we get lawyers. They're working on uh, prescriptive rights, so they want to see all of our old maps to see if there's any roads that were described on some of the maps. Um, we get students from the college doing research or elsewhere. Dick Berg had a PhD candidate come in and look at his talc samples recently. So we get all kinds of different people. I just never know what the day is going to bring. It's fun. It's, what can I say? It's fun. Yeah. <laughs>